Kia ora, tolo falava, and a warm welcome to another episode of The Counter Ruck, a podcast where we discuss all things rugby. I'm the host of The Counter Ruck, Stacey, and today we welcome um, a regular on our podcast, all the way from the city of the future, Mr. Joey Nanai. Joey, thanks for coming on, brother. Thank you, and thank you for recognising us as the city of the future. <laughs> well, we will be touching on the city of the future in this podcast, obviously, but... Um, yeah, before we get into it, I'll um, the two Super Rugby finals. Actually, we'll look at both. Uh, before we get into them, I'll take care of our housekeeping stuff as usual. So, our website, check us out um, www.wizwiznet.com, and also you can follow the Counter Ruck on Twitter and Facebook. So, give us a follow and give us a like on there. Now, uh, Joey, I'm not sure if you caught our podcast last week, but uh, we chatted with Tracy Artinga, the CEO of Kanaloa. And you've effectively been our, our resident uh, expert, <laughs> counter-rack expert on the you know Pacific expansion teams into Super Rugby. So, you know, what did you make of that, of what she had to say in that uh, interview? And you've got any thoughts on on what she had to say, basically? Yeah, well, um, it was quite a insightful uh, interview, I thought. There were things there that uh, I didn't know before that um, Tracy had mentioned, which is, you know, it adds to the um, the, the fire, <laughs> the frenzy, if you like. Um, there were things that she mentioned just about um, Kanaloa and um, the waiting game that they now play whilst, uh, you know, the Fiji Jura team and um, Moana Pacifica um are in the middle of you know how they're in the middle of um getting funding together i believe it's 10 million she said yeah yeah 10 million in the space of what six or seven weeks or something like that so it's not there's not much time to get a team together get funding together and get it all together so um yeah for me that was that was quite interesting that part as well as um the fact that they've been able to hold off on any legal proceedings that they may have had in mind leading towards the end of last year um, for, you know, for uh, against NZR. So I think um, I, c- I would like to commend them on that decision because, um, you know, emotions would have been very high um, when that decision was made to to give um, co- was it conditional licenses to Fiji uh, to Moana Pacifica and Fiji Draw, so yeah, I think emotions would have been very high, and you know um, when you don't have experience or confidence in your own um, your own value or your own proposition, then you're going to make silly decisions in the moment in the heat of, you know, all that emotion. So well done to them for holding off on that and deciding, you know what, we're going to wait and um, see how it pans out, see if Moana Pacifica and uh, Drua actually do, you know, um, what they said they're going to do or what they believe they're going to do. And, and I also found it interesting that they were happy to um, – point their investors towards Fiji Drawer to help their campaign. I thought thought it was a very smart move because of the two um, of the two um, parties that were given the conditional licenses, Fiji Drawer are the standalone, you know, hundred percent standalone. So um, similar to Kana Law, they get to make their own decisions and it's a, it's a fully um, self-sufficient team in, in all aspects. So, um, And what that means is there's no Rugby Australia or Rugby New Zealand getting involved in decision-making or 20, any 20%, 80% business where they get to, you know, they get to trial or test or drop or um, experiment with, with players that they want to and when they want to and um, – not expect any, you know, 
any resistance when they do that. So um, as, as they now have the ability to do, uh, with with uh, Moana Pacifica, so I thought I thought it was it was quite an interesting and insightful um, interview, indeed. Yeah, yeah, that's my first time actually meeting Tracy and talking to her. She's onto it. Eh? She seems pretty sharp. So, you know, I felt just after talking to her, if they were kind of law was to win the bid, I think that they could be quite successful. But I was a bit concerned because the fact that they've already got the financial backing. They can get the team and the coaches together ready. They've got a good team in place. They put in a bid when Moana Pacifica didn't even put in a bid. And despite all that, all those positives, they still got overlooked. Uh, so it says to me, unfortunately, I think the writing might be on the wall for Kanaloa, which is really unfortunate. I think that, you know, she talked about the control that New Zealand rugby wants to have over the this Pacific team, and I think that's going to be what ultimately stops Kanaloa getting involved. I don't think that New Zealand rugby will allow a team, a Pacific team, to come in that New Zealand rugby doesn't have some element of control over. Now, I was, yeah, carry on. Were you going to say something, did you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, look, it's... Um... It's 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 quite a funny one because you know New Zealand rugby they they realise that they've got an entity in uh, Kana Law that will not be puppeteered. You know they will not have their strings pulled by NZR by no means, and they're willing to do it all alone, find their own funding alone, and do all that at this at the expense of any kind of benefits of having a. Um, access to NZR's expertise, experience, and, and business network. Kana Law, obviously, you know, have have some some bright minds there that are confident yep. enough that they'll get the job done. And, and by all accounts, it sounds like they do have the means and the ability to, to put uh, something together, a product together that, can and and would benefit Samoa and Tonga unions, which is one of the main questions that have that have come out of all this malarkey, if you like. Um, you know, and if you ask yourself, you know, where where does the MP share of um, um, gains go to? And by gains, I mean you know. If you think deep into this scenario, you think, you know, right now, NZR have, what, five teams, which only generates X amount, if you're talking about broadcasting, right? Now, by adding a sixth team via Moana Pacifica, they now have more leverage. NZR now have more leverage when negotiating the TV rights with, say, Sky TT, Sky TV. It's pretty. It's pretty simple. Whereas, you know, kind of law. Uh, want you know by from what I've seen, kind of law have wanted to decide their own broadcasting rights with with the likes of Sky. Um, that means they would have got their own slice separately. Then they would have given shares to Tonga and Samoa directly, right? So, if you look into it that way, Samoa and Tonga lose out on any broadcasting gains that are now diluted because of the involvement of New Zealand rugby. So this this team, for me, as an outsider looking in, who's not um, by any means affiliated or, or um, in association with any of the, the three parties, um, it just looks like this team is for NZR gain, the, the Moana Pacifica team. And that's what my concern has been all along, is that, okay, is this simply a ploy for NZR to gain from? And, you know, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have fans of rugby who will say, well, NZR should have some gains from this. Why, why wouldn't they have gains from this? Yeah, absolutely, they, they, they probably should. They probably feel like they should. They probably feel like they are the A side in every interaction they have. And rightly so, you know, they've they've been taught no other other way. So, you know, but sometimes I question, you know, some of the um, rhetoric that comes back from 
um, various corners of the, the Pacific who, you know, just question these these entities or these organizations or these conglomerates or these groups, they're using our Pacific brand as a selling point to, to the broadcaster. They're talking to the broadcaster on our behalf. Now, if you don't see what's wrong with that, then you're missing a lot. Whereas, whereas you look at a a, a draw or kind of law, they're talking direct to to Sky. Maybe not so much draw, but kind of law for sure. They're talking direct to the likes of Sky and creating their own revenue share of the broadcasting. You see, um, and that's where you've got to have faith in you know people who've been there and done that. So I guess, I guess if if you've been in a room full of full of uh, you know decision makers like boards of directors and you know what it's like to um, put proposals forward both physically on paper and in the verbal form then you'll you'll have some experience in and how to deal with these matters um so i just think you know i just think the 80 20 percent thing 80 percent 20 percent thing whenever i hear about it i think of puppets and puppeteers you know? Yep. And it's sad. It is. Are you, now that's my first time doing a um, sort of an interview style podcast. I know they, they're trying to get Tracy to come on the back of the 135, which is one of our other podcasts on our network. And they're, they're very good at doing the interview style. But you're right, though, you, those points you raised, which I should have probably followed up on Tracy with. I wanted to know if she was prepared to make some concessions, if it does come around. Because I don't know if the way they, the current bill that they've got i don't know that new zealand rugby union will sign off on that just for the reasons you said they'll get none of that broadcast money if kanaloa negotiated themselves you know they can operate on their own they could potentially take a hundred percent of the players that they want new zealand rugby it's a scary thought for new zealand rugby to allow that to happen without control so i wonder if um yeah if it came to it if she would be prepared to do with the 80 20 just to get it over the line to say, because I don't know, New Zealand rugby, and I don't think New Zealand rugby are going to go with kind of Law's proposal, even though it's very good, they're well organised, they've got the finances from, if you didn't have sort of a biasness, you'd think this this seems like the easy answer, they're ready to go. But they've gone for sort of the answer that's a lot more convoluted, because it suits, they can have their hand in it a bit more, you know, so... Yeah, I, I think that she might come up on one of our other podcasts and I know the, the back of the 135 guys are really good at pressing that stuff. So good thoughts there, Joey, for sure. And we'll keep following that kind of law story, um, Wana Pacifica story, all of these Pacific bids quite closely. So it still looks like there still seems to be the story that never ends in a lot of ways for us as well. <laughs> Didn't keep coming back to it. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's nice. it's just relatable to other areas of society, um, especially, you know, from the eyes of a Pacifica in New Zealand, you know. It's not just rugby where this happens. This happens all over the show, you know. This is it's just been highlighted more by this kind of law saga, if you like. Um uh, NZR saga. Yeah, it's quite interesting. It's unfortunate as well because I think well, we'll see what happens. I thought kind of law the, the bid that they proposed would be more helpful towards Pacific rugby, but obviously New Zealand rugby are pulling the strings and they're interested in what's good for New Zealand rugby. So, yeah, we'll definitely keep following that up. But, um, right, we'll look at some Super Rugby finals. So, um, the Reds, the Reds left it late to beat the Brumbies 19-16 to and they won Super Rugby Australia and the Chiefs, they won their fifth Super Rugby title straight. <laughs> by downing the Chiefs, you know, your neck of the woods there. Uh, 24-13 was the final score. So look at that game first. Crusaders-Chiefs, mate, what did you make of that final? Mate, I just, I thought it was very unfortunate and uh, for, for the Chiefs to lose the way they did. I thought um, it was kind of a fairy tale journey towards the final, which would have been nice to, to, to see a Chiefs win, but it wasn't to be. And that was just due to uh, several missed chances throughout the game. 
and you know no more than 13 versus 15 you know how how do you blow that kind of an opportunity right questions have to be asked um you know and those missed chances came back to bite them in the bum in the end so um yeah quite unfortunate and i feel sorry f- for for the chiefs uh setup and you know all those involved and getting them to the final it must have been really sad yeah yeah for sure um i I was speaking to Cameron, who's doing our fact checking at the moment, and he mentioned this point. So they were down, they were down to 13 men. The Crusaders, the Chiefs get a penalty, and they went for a shot at goal. And maybe if they sort of kick for the corner, went for the try with the two men overlap. You know, who knows? It could have been a different game at that point. But um, you know, I thought Moonga, Richie Moonga, he was um, he was bloody awesome when they were down to 13 guys, and I thought he really stepped up in that second half and took control of the game. So. You know, he looks more and more assured and more like the the All Black first five that you would expect to do that sort of thing. So, yeah, I was gutted for the Chiefs. Just for our regular listeners will know, uh, we put a $10 bet on. And at the start of the season, when the Chiefs had lost, well, was it 10 games in a row? Roger, who's another regular on the counter he said he wanted to put $10 on the Chiefs to win the title. And, um, yeah, I thought that was a waste of money, but we did it. So I'm actually shocked they got that far, and I was I've never cheered for the Chiefs as much as I've cheered for them this week, just for me being a Blues fan. It wasn't to be, but man, the fact that they got that far, like you said, that was quite a fairy tale. I don't think anyone, they lost the first two games of the season, and I think people would have, you know, if you could have asked people, you think the Chiefs would win the wooden spoon or get to the final, people would have said, no way, they're not going to make the final, they're going to be down the bottom again. So it was a massive sort of second half of the competition comeback as well so hmm uh, I'll just get your thoughts and I heard saw this I was listening to uh, Devlin and he was talking about the Crusaders midfield how awesome they were so David Havili at second five and Whanganuku at uh, 13 and he thought that they could be potentially the all black midfield so they got it they got a good mix there you know they've got the power and the strength and the size of of Whanganuku and they got the skills and the kicking game of Havili and it's just like a good mix of them two together. But mate, have you, do you got any thoughts on that? Do you think that they could be a potential some smokies there for the midfield for the All Blacks? Hey, look, I, I don't, I don't think he's entirely wrong. I mean, and I can I can see logically why that would work. Um, my only question mark is where does that leave? The, the ALBs, you know, and the um, yes. who else is there? Is there Lo Mape? Is he even in the in the picture? Is he even in the conversation? Um, you know, and and the good Hughes when he's injury free. Um, but yeah, where does that leave? You know, Anton Leonard Brown as a as a first choice. So that's that's the only question I would have on on you know Devlin's ramblings. But um, otherwise, you know, he's spot on. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Anton Leonard Brown, he's sort of too good to to leave out. So, yeah, not a bad midfield choice actually. I I, I think that they might both get in the All Blacks as well, which is you know testament. And also playing alongside Moonga, that if they could have a 10, 12, 13 who have a familiarity, that could also be an advantage. But um, I'm not sure if we want to talk about this, but there's some rumours about some hotel damage. Did you hear about <laughs> that? Just being oh, bad sports? What's going yeah, on there? Yeah. I, is that, a, hear, is that a Hamiltonian that thing or what's going, or what's going on? on? I did hear some murmurs. Yes, I did indeed. I heard some murmurs, uh, but not only from the Chiefs crowd, but the, you know, also the the some murmurs about other incidents from the Highlanders crowd. You know, um, the hotel carnage. You know, from the Chiefs, um, mate. Like, but they have come out and said, you know, one of their representatives have come out and said, um, I think it was the CEO of the Chiefs came out and said it wasn't them. So you've got one side who are the media saying it was them. And then you've got uh, a direct denial of the incident having any involvement by the Chiefs players from the CEO. So um, it's it's something I would look further into, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. The Chiefs, oh man, come on, guys. Although I can't blame them. If I was in their shoes in my twenties, you know, you lost the final against thirteen guys that you think you probably 
could have or should have won, I'd be so salty. You add a few beers into the mix and I'd be a horrible person to be around. So, yeah, we don't, not that we condone that sort of behavior if it's true, but, you know, it's, I will say that I, I can sort of get with what happened. But if you look at the actual complaints of the lady, it was just all it was, was they were staying on the same floor or they weren't on the same floor. They may be visiting their mates who were staying on the same floor of the 12th floor of that hotel. I think it was the Novotel. It was what, what was in the pictures. Um, and she alleged that they kept awake by banging on doors and talking really loudly. I mean, uh, come on, come on. Really? Yeah. I get that it's, you know, wee small hours of the morning, but come on. You complained with that? That was the noise complaint? Yeah. You, compl- yeah. you know, it's not like they blasted their sounds in, inside their room and, you know, all hours of the morning, but yeah. Um. So so it was it was half an hour. It was a half an hour window from four a.m. to four, well four twenty, and then they broke it up at four thirty. So within a half hour window, which is four a.m. to four thirty, which I'm guessing this is when they've come back from McDonald's after having a feed at McDonald's after the clubs close at three, right? Right. And they've got back to their hotel room and you know are loud and obnoxious as you are, as you can yep. be, right? I'm guessing that's what happened, you know, if if it was the Chiefs or if whoever it was that were staying at their hotel at the time. So I can understand the the logic, yep. the logistics of that, for sure. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we've just got to say, you know, I suppose well done to the Crusaders again, five in a row. I mean, the Foster better start winning some games for the All Blacks because I know that Scott Roberts and the All Blacks, the drums will be beating louder and louder and louder for him to be the All Black coach. So Foster... If you're listening, you probably ain't, but if you are, <laughs> mate, get your act together, brother. But, uh, yeah, mate, we'll look at the Australian one. So the final, again, it was the Reds against the Brumbies, and the Brumbies left it late, so they took it out 19 points to 16. I'm not sure if you caught much of that one. Yeah, I did catch a little bit of the one. Um, I especially caught the interview <laughs> at the end by Sonny Bill Williams on um, Tanya Lodge. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was good. Yeah, it was a, it was a quite a heartfelt interview, I thought. Um, and good on the young fellow. Do we still call him young? Yeah, we're good on the young fellow um, for taking on that interview and uh, showing raw emotion. That was good. It's good to see. Yep. Yep. Um, I know what was it? James O'Connor looked like he got all the nineteen points for the Brum- for the Reds, so he was bloody outstanding. And I know they got a yellow card to Rob Valentini, who's been bloody awesome all year. And that was a crucial moment in the game. It was sort of towards the back end, uh, sort of mid run the 60 minute mark, I think. And that sort of helped to swing the momentum to the Reds. Um, but I heard this interesting stat. So they played three times the Reds and the Brumbies this year. And the Brumbies have led, uh, so that's 240 minutes of rugby in those three games. And the Brumbies have led for 236 minutes wow against the reds yeah and the reds ended up winning all three games so <laughs> wow yeah that's three times in a row they've bloody stolen it at the death um mm. yeah well if you if you listen to the interview that Sonia Latupol did with Sonny Bill you could tell that they really didn't want were sick of losing to the Brumbies like they did last year in in the the Super Rugby Australia final last year Mm-hmm. where they played the Brumbies and lost over there in Canberra and you know they wanted to make amends and obviously this year they learned from their mistakes and had a good preseason came back and obviously done a good job on them three times over so good on them yeah good on them for um how do they say in in uh, rugby after match speeches um rectified their mistakes <laughs> nice yeah it's interesting you brought that up because James O'Connor when he got interviewed I think this was just before the first game that they played this year and he talked about that as well how they keep losing to the Brumbies and he said he was watching the last dance and he brought that up he said you know we keep losing and I take that personally and then he wanted to make sure that they got the win so you know good on them good on them for that but um, yeah the Reds uh, the Crusaders they were probably the two best teams on on both sides, to be fair. So it's, um, 
I think it's a it's a fair result that they ended up winning. Um, yeah, that they ended up winning. So congrats to those teams. But uh, yeah, we'll just have a quick update on our Wiz Wiz medal. So um, just for our listeners, we've got the Wiz Wiz medal for the Super Rugby Player of the Year, and it's named after our network. So uh, how it works is we review each game and allocate three points to the best player two for the second best player and one for the third best player and then we'll just uh, add up all the points at the end of the season to get a winner of the Wes Wes medal as our player of the year so we are including the Trans Tasman section in this so it's going to keep going and that means it's still wide open but if I have a quick look at our leaderboard here so in first place we've still got Damien McKenzie he after you know the Chiefs got some late form so he's on 11 points we've got a two uh, two guys on 9 points so Cody uh, Cody Taylor and Rob Valentini and then James O'Connor with another man of the match performance he's uh, on 4th and 8 points so still wide open um, uh, another update our TAB account so the last bit we did was your one uh, Joey we put on the, the Blues to beat the Chiefs. Now, I should have done it earlier on in the, that week, but I did it towards the end when the teams got named, and then the odds just plummeted. So the Blues were only paying uh, $1.20 at that point. But, hey, we still got to win, and we'll take it. So that puts us up to $167 for our count. Um, and we're going to place a bet. So we'll have a quick, sneaky look at some of the Trans-Tasman Super Rugby Trans Tasman, which starts up this week. Won't look at all the games, but I'll just get some thoughts, mate. Um, what have you make? What are you making of these Aussie teams? It's still hard to sort of gauge without them playing against the New Zealand teams. How do you think they're going to fare? Or how do you think we're going to fare as well? Are we as good as we think we are? <laughs> have you got any thoughts on any of those types of things? Um, yeah. Uh, before I get into that, just a quick jab at the uh, my mate Roger and the old Chiefs there. Um, yes. It was nice to see that Blues game where they actually gave them a bit of a walloping, didn't they, uh, the old Chiefs? Um, mm. And and I would say, I would go as far as saying, they probably softened them up a bit too much leading into their final with the Crusaders. But anyway, I'll leave it at that and uh, carry on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just so on the, to- the, Chiefs lost, uh, the Chiefs lost 12 in a row. Then I think they won five in a row. You know what, they're on a two-game losing streak, so they're all about the streaks. Maybe they're going to go on another losing streak again, and we'll, we can give the Blues some credit for that. Yeah, no, so carry on, Joe. What are you going to, are you going to add, brother? Yeah, just on the um, the Super Rugby Australia teams versus, you know, say, um, Super Rugby New Zealand. Obviously, time will tell now that we've got the Super Rugby Trans-Tasman set to kick off this Friday. Um but uh, it was interesting to see that, you know, the, the Inform 15, um, according to Campbell Burns, um, who was a Sky Sport um, journo, 14 of the 15 he chose came from the final, which was Brumbies and Reds. The only other guy was number 14, the right winger, Marika Koroimbete from the oh, Rebels. Yeah. Yeah, he so was bloody good. I think that's quite telling indeed that um, most of their, I guess, most of their strengths lie in, you know, in the Reds and Brumbies franchises, uh, organisations. So, um, but I guess when, when they come up against these New Zealand teams who uh, are now, I think some of them are over there, aren't they? Over there in Australia already. Um I think it's going to be. It's going to go. What it's going to go. More in favour to the home teams, I'd say, mm. because they've got their home field advantage, which is you know the, the Aussie teams. But at the same time, I think um, the teams that missed out on the weekend on finals will be raring to go. Um, maybe not so much Highlanders after their debacle at you no. Know, um, after their little controversial um, nights out or whatever, but uh, more so the Blues and maybe the Hurricanes. I think those two teams will definitely have a point to prove. Um, Hurricanes especially need to point, prove something, so they haven't proved anything all year, really. But, um, yeah, I think the rugby teams in Australia, um, you know, there, there's some standouts that are definitely worth watching. 
this competition, this part of the competition for. And one that you named earlier was James O'Connor. He is absolutely on fire at the moment in terms of um, his self-discipline by the looks of it. Um, and that's showing in his play. It's just showing that he's he's matured as a rugby player and um, things are working well for him and and the guys that are that are working around him are actually you know uh, reacting in a positive way. So that could only mean well for him leading into any international duties later on. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Like James O'Connor, I remember when he jumped on, he came on the scene. I think he was basically straight out of school, straight into Super Rugby. He was a childhood prodigy, and he sort of fell off the rails a little bit. And he looked like he was never going to fulfill his potential. But I don't know, after getting cut from the Wallabies and being a bit of an, an idiot, he's gone away, he's matured, and he's come back. And he looks like he's finally turned into the player he was always supposed to be, which is good for him to get that redemption. But, uh, yeah, I quite like the look of the Reds. Um, and interesting to see how they go. I'm not surprised that 14 of the 15 guys were from that final because it does look like in the Australian side, there's a definite top two. And then there's a bit of a gap to the other three. So, mm. so, yeah, definitely the Reds and the Brumbies will be the teams to watch. Uh, one thing about this trans Tasman is there is another final. So, come on, Blues. <laughs> you let us down. you gotta, you got to do us right. But, uh, yeah, for our TAB account, mate, do you want to put a bid on, say, a winner or a wooden spoon or anything along those lines? Oh, that's a good one. Just for our um, 10 bucks or a multi. Mate. Um... We're basically playing with free money because from what we started off, eh? So I'm happy to... Do you mean a competition winner? Yeah, yeah, we can go for that. Look, I think the easy money is Crusaders, but um, I don't like to take easy money. I like to take risks. And I think the Chiefs will have a point to prove, and I really do hope they do well in this Trans-Tasman derby. Um, so I would back the Chiefs or the Blues to take out the comp. So either wow. of those two for mine. Nice, nice. Chiefs or Blues? Um, let me just pull something up here. I saw something a bit earlier, which I was looking at. Whilst you're doing that, one one um, cool thing I've noticed is with the Super Rugby Form 15 of Australia, you've got nine out of 15 players of Pacifica Heritage. And that could that could contest a similar team by New Zealand, I'd say. A Super Rugby Aotearoa Form 15. Mm. I think, you know, you probably have more Pacifica in the Aussie team than the maybe the New Zealand team. Not sure. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, Ken Laban, who's, you know, he's a renowned uh, New Zealand sort of sports um, media guy, and when they were talking about Moana Pacifica and what their intentions are, he brought up the fact that I think the All Blacks had 17 Polynesian players last year, but the Wallabies had 20. So they had more Islanders and the Wallabies than the All Blacks do, which is uh, which is just sort of touching on what you're saying as well. So Australian influx of Polynesians is you know, fast rising, similar to where New Zealand rugby is at as well. So, yeah, not surprising in a way. But I'm just pulling up these odds here. So Crusaders, $1.83. That's not even worth betting on. But this is a surprise for me. The Blues are the second favourites at $7. And then the Chiefs at eight fifty to win it. Um, yeah, wow, all right. <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not even going to bother on the Crusaders at $1.83. That's not even... See, I would say the bookies have gone for the Blues over the Chiefs based on purely on that performance at Eden Park and the previous one where, you know, I think it was Blues that won as well. So Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's what they're basing it on. So um yeah, and rightly so, but at the same time, they shouldn't write off uh, you know, a chief side that is that were gutted in their performance in the final. Yeah, so who are we going for? Who uh, we'll put a ten dollars on someone. Who did you say? Sorry? I I I, my heart wants me to go for the Blues, but I've never bet with my heart. I always bet with my mind, and the Chiefs uh, are it for me. Nice. Chiefs at 8 50 That's looking good money as well. Um, just on the Chiefs, your uh, family member is going to be a big loss for them. He's decided to go the Olympic route. So Yeah. 
So um, look, I'm 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 of the thinking that the Olympics is every four years, and the opportunity to go to the Olympics as a in in form, um, you know, peaked rugby player or peaking rugby player. I would go for the Olympics if I was him. So uh, I think he's made the right choice, as has Caleb Clark. And I think there is one more. I can't remember who it is, but there is one more uh, from Super Rugby, I'll tell all, that is going to the Olympics. Um, I think it's the best choice for them because they're still young enough to come back and vie for um, all black opportunities, whereas the opportunities to do the Olympics thing it doesn't come around all the time. Mm. I wonder how close he would have been to, I suppose, the All Blacks radar, because he had established himself as the number one wing at the Chiefs, and I think he was right up there for defenders beaten with that step and all the rest of it. So, Is that right? He, yeah, he was. I think he was second behind Richie Mwanga. Um, he this was was a real breakout season for him. You know, he's sort of been on the. In there, but you know they had Ale Malo and they had uh, Sean Stevenson and all of these other guys that pick. But this time it was his. It was clear that he was their first choice wing. So it's quite interested, interesting to see how how he would have gone. I think it's testament to um, his, I guess, discipline and focus that um, he's had a breakout season like the season he's just had. He this time last year, I still remember sending him a couple of messages. Um, just encouraging him because he, this time last year, he was sent back to club rugby um, to play in the county's Monaco rugby t- uh, competition. And he, I think it was Manu Dewa he played for, but yeah, he was sent back to club rugby. And um, I know what it's like for players to be sent back to lower levels after playing in a, in a, in a, in the top team. And, and I also know what it's like to not get the feedback that you're after in terms of work-ons, in terms of where you're at, where you're standing in the team uh, hierarchy um, uh, kind of thing. So, you know, words of encouragement um, are definitely needed from all corners. So if you've got a, a family member or a friend who goes through that, and you want to reach out to them, just reach out to them, send them a message and say, hey, look, you know, these things happen not just in rugby but in life. And you've got to go and uh, you've got to keep keep on keeping on and keep fighting that good fight. Yeah. Yeah, well, good, good there. I think I, I'm with you. If I was in his shoes or Caleb Clark's shoes or whatever, you know, you, the Olympics is once in a lifetime opportunity, so you got to go for it. You know, when he's an old old and retired and all the rest of it, you will look back and think, man, you know, I really went after that once in a lifetime opportunity and I chased it. So, you know, I'm not going to knock that. But we're just joined by, uh, you know, our Chiefs, resident Chiefs fan here, Rog, who's jumped on a bit late. So, Roger, mate, we were talking before we put our $10 bet on at the start of the season, if you remember, for the Chiefs to win. And that looked a million miles away. And then they uh, fluked their way into the final, I'll say. And just came up a little bit short. So I'll give you a couple of um, a minute or so to have your rant about the Chiefs. And just what you thought of that game in the final. Oh, okay. Yeah, I agree. Just cut yourself off. <laughs> you're on mute, mate. Rod, you're still on mute. <laughs> this is typical of the Chiefs. Everything was malfunctioning, <laughs> just like your internet again. It's, it's the story of what happened in the final, basically. Are you still working out your internet from last time? <laughs> Unbelievable. Nice. Rog, mate, can you get yours to work? No, no luck. Or you just, you don't want to speak about your team. But um, yeah, well, uh, I'm glad you came on because when you, if you thought that was a ridiculous bet for you to put $10 on the Chiefs to win Super Rugby Aotearoa, Joey's jumped on and put ten dollars on the Chiefs to win uh, Super Rugby Trans Trans Tasman. So uh, our ten dollars is going on that, and we look like we're going to be hopefully in the money. You know, my heart's still with the Blues, but if the Chiefs did win and we got the eighty-five dollars, it's going to be, I wouldn't be too disappointed. But um, you yeah, are just about to close up now, Roger. Unless you've got something you want to add. Um, 
Joy, mate, I'll get you to just um, jump through, mate. Have you got some final thoughts that we got for our, our pod, just on the Super Rugby, anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I don't know if Roger still thinks this is a makeshift competition like he did last season. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it was, it was nice to see the Chiefs after their um, – O and twelve <laughs> situation come back and make the final. You know uh, that was that was quite nice from a, from a rugby fans' point of view. It was nice to see that they went up there and gave it their all with you know the Crusaders. Unfortunately, it wasn't the best performance that they could have hoped for, and they blew some some chances, some especially in the kicking side of things with uh, Damien McKenzie not making three kicks. Um, that could have, I, I believe, could have turned the game for them, because as as a forward who sees their um, kicker slot goals, doesn't matter if it's a three three point gap or a twenty one point gap, just seeing your kicker slot a goal, that's um, you know that's going to help you mentally to recalibrate, reset, and get back there and think about the next job. But when your kicker is missing three in a row. That's got to be a little bit demoralizing for your team to 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 even offer him a word of encouragement after the third one. You know, uh, all right, mate. Next job. All right, mate. That's all good. We have those kind of days. But then you miss a third one in a row. What do you say? You know, as a forward, you know, the expletives must have come out in their minds at least. But um, you know, it was it was quite a good competition. I thought um, the the right two teams made the final, even though my heart's with the Blues. Um, the Blues didn't deserve to be in the final based on the opportunities they let go. They put themselves in their position and have no one else to blame but themselves. I think the Chiefs really capitalised on the opportunities that were given to them after they started winning again, which was, which was nice to see. So... Um, the Hurricanes, they were the biggest disappointment for me in the competition because at the beginning I thought they at least had a you know, had some inspiration in the inclusion of uh the the, the black bus. Do we still call them the black bus? The bus um in their wider squad and you know, to have an older head like that come into the team, you would think his experience would be imparted on on the young blokes, but I guess they've got some learnings there for from the season. They've got, um, and then you have the other, you know, the other distraction, which is the the Pacifica teams of you know Fiji Draw and Moana Pacifica being mentioned as uh, teams for next season inclusion for Super Rugby, and you know I think that that would have been a distraction to some degree for certain uh, fringe Pacifica players anyway. Um, I would have, you know, been like, well, if I don't do well in my Super Rugby team this year, uh, maybe I have a shot at uh, being part of that twenty percent next year in, in Moana Pacifica. So all these scenarios play out, and I'm sure the there's, there's enough of a distraction with the the, the never ending, it seems, pandemic or you know disruption. Um, so I think. Players are really looking forward to uh, right now to this Trans Tasman competition or part of the, the the season, and looking to really make their mark because this is where they get to write their names and their respective international teams. Yeah, good thoughts there. Um, I agree with the a lot of that actually. Uh, Roger, are you having some any luck? No. Roger shaking his head because he's watching a replay of the Chiefs versus Crusaders. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this trans Tasman section is going to be interesting. So all we've had really is New Zealand teams playing against each other. I don't think, like pre-COVID was when the last sort of match against the non-New Zealand team was took place. So I think this next section is going to be interesting. You know, uh, the Reds to me look the real deal. And I'm not sure where, you know, 
they are. We always know the Crusaders are good, but where everyone else is is still a bit up in the air, and I think that adds a bit of excitement to this upcoming competition. So I'm happy we put the ten dollars on the Chiefs. Actually, I think that I just hope it's someone else other than the Crusaders wins, which is uh, what I'm really hoping for. But it's hard to bet against them when you look at how good they are, and you know, even though I, I dislike them, you have to give them a lot of um, a lot of credit. So, yeah, it's going to be a real interesting section. I know that Dave Rennie will be really happy with the form of some of those players, so that puts a bit of extra spice into the the, you know, the international part uh, phase of the competitions as well. But, um, yeah, I, I'm just quite interested to see what happens. And I'm trying to stall here so I can give Roger some minutes to sort out his technical difficulties. But it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to be us. Um <laughs> just want to thank thank everyone for coming on thank the listeners for joining us for another episode of the counter <laughs> we're available on the usual podcast platform so stitcher spotify apple there's another google podcast iHeartRadio, radio wherever you find your podcast you'll find us there and also youtube so we can watch us on there so um thanks boys for being a part of it joey mate you're a knowledgeable man so appreciate everything rog thanks for your silent partnership in this podcast <laughs> <laughs> and Cameron mate thanks for doing the fact checky for us well, that's us boys so we'll be back again uh, next week so thanks Roger shocking I bet you're going to find your, your, your way into this <laughs> now I bet it's going to be fixed now